organizers of this conference have asked me to speak about unity in the church. And ladies and gentlemen, if you think about it, this is a very strange choice. Asking a journalist to talk about unity is a little bit like asking a terrorist to talk about peace. The truth is, we journalists are not usually in the unity business. We thrive on conflict. We are, after all, storytellers. And conflict is the fuel of drama, so we are drawn to stories of conflict. However, as it happens, if you were going to ask a journalist to talk to you about unity, you may have made a fairly good choice in me, because this is actually a subject I have thought long and hard about over the years. And it's because of what has always struck me as a very curious reaction to my work. If you all did a poll of people in the United States who either read my stuff in print or who hear me talk on television, you would hear all kinds of things, I guarantee you. But the number one most common thing you would hear is that I strike people as balanced, that is, as fair to different points of view. By the way, if you've ever wondered about the difference between me and Andrea Tornielli, this is it. The number one most common thing you would hear about Andrea is that that guy really knows his stuff. The number one most common thing you hear about me is that I'm balanced. The translation is that Andrea knows way more than I do. Okay. Now, I think the reason that people uh, comment on this, uh, on, on what strikes them as the balance or the fairness of what I do, is because, at least in the United States, they do not get that many other places. Okay. I have to say, as a journalist, I will tell you, I have never, ever, not once, set out to try to write a balanced story. The only thing that I am trying to achieve is accuracy. Okay, I'm trying to get the story right. But in my experience, that means that you have to res respect the complexity of situations. That means talking to all kinds of different points of view, recognizing there are strong opinions on every question, trying to do justice to those opinions. To me, that's what it means to get the story right. Therefore, balance is a byproduct of accuracy. However, the fact people feel compelled to comment on the fact that I try to provide balance reflects a painful truth about the church in the United States, which is that the Catholic Church in the United States is profoundly divided on virtually every possible subject. Now, I'm going to talk today mostly about the situation facing the church in the United States. I will leave it because it's what I know best. I will leave it to you to decide if any of this is useful to the church in Chile or wherever you happen to come from. Okay. So I basically am going to do four things. I'm going to give you a broad observation about the subject of unity in the church. Second, I'm going to describe the situation in the United States to you as best I can. Third, I will offer my thoughts on what I believe to be the only possible solution to promoting greater unity uh, in the church. And then fourth, I'll end with a final thought about what all this means. Okay? Let's begin with a broad observation. Okay? The broad observation is this. Diversity in the church is a marvelous, wonderful thing. It is a source of richness. And the last thing we want to do is seek unity through a kind of false uniformity, okay, that would smother that diversity. Let me be concrete. I think one of the glories of the Catholic Church is that we embrace both people like Hans Kung and people like George Weigel. I think it is a source of great richness that we embrace both Comunione e Liberazione and anche Sant'Egidio. I think it is a great strength that we embrace both Opus Dei and the Society of Jesus. Okay, I would not want a Catholic Church in which we were forced to choose among these different things. And this is not just my view. Pope Benedict, in 2007, when he went up to the north of Italy for vacation, had a question and answer session with the priests of the diocese he was in. It was Belluno e Valletta, if I'm not wrong. 
And one of the priests asked him a question about the about human formation and spiritual formation. And he said, it is often difficult for us to accomplish these things at the same time. And the Holy Father's classic answer was that, historically speaking, Catholicism is the religion of the great et et, the great both and. That is, where others see either or choices, we see both and solutions. That what's in the Catholic soul when faced with an option between two seemingly irreconcilable forces, is that rather than choosing one or the other, we try to see the best in both and try to put together some kind of synthesis. That is always the Catholic instinct. Okay? My point, therefore, is that we should not be threatened by diversity in the church. The fact that we have passionate opinions on many sides of many questions that we have many different camps in the church, many different currents and instincts. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a problem, it is a treasure. It's what makes Catholicism a church rather than a sect. So we should embrace that diversity and celebrate it. The problem, of course, becomes when this diversity expresses itself in division. Okay? When diversity becomes division, that's when we've got a problem on our hands. And unfortunately, this is too often the painful reality of our situation. If we take an honest look inside the church, if we take a clear-eyed look at the reality of Catholic life, and I speak here especially of the United States, I think we would have to concede that quite often we are not merely diverse, we are also divided. Okay? And I find that division difficult and painful for two reasons. Okay. One, for me, it is personally painful. The reality of my job uh, is that I have to talk to all kinds of different Catholics all the time. Okay. So I am talking to the most liberal Catholics and I am talking to the most conservative Catholics. I am talking to those Catholics most concerned with the internal life of the church and those Catholics most concerned with what's going on in the outside world. Okay? I am talking to high church Catholics who love the old Latin Mass, and I talk to low church charismatic Catholics who, if they could get away with it, would play banjos and tambourines during the Eucharistic prayer. Okay? I'm talking to all kinds of Catholics, and in my experience, I like them all. Generally speaking, I find all of these people to be smart and talented and compassionate and dedicated. And it pains me that people in these other camps often don't see the same positive qualities uh, in these people that I do. I think this is a natural human instinct. When you are friends with someone, you want your other friends to like that person too. This is how I feel about the church. But second, and more deeply, I find this division painful for another reason, which is, listen, I am nobody's idea of a great missionary, nobody's idea of a theologian, but I will tell you this, if there is one thing I have learned about covering the Catholic Church for two decades, it is that anger is not a good missionary strategy. Okay. People, especially idealistic young people, do not want to give their lives to something negative. They don't want to affiliate themselves with a church in which people seem to be constantly at one another's throats. If we are going to set the world on fire with the faith, we have to present the world with a positive option. We have to be clear that fundamentally the Catholic message is not a no to something. It is a profound and passionate yes it is the key that unlocks the mystery of the human heart. And in order to communicate that effectively, in order to express it persuasively to young people who are seeking in this world, who are trying to make a choice from this vast, vast buffet of lifestyle options in the postmodern world, okay, in order to persuade them that Catholicism is the right entree, we need to be clear that fundamentally, at its core, 
this is a positive, passionate, affirmative message. Okay. And constantly fighting with one another, constantly pointing fingers with one another, and passing judgment on one another is not a persuasive way to go about this. Okay. So unity is not merely important because it was the final command of Christ to his disciples, the final priestly prayer in the Gospel of John that they may all be one. Unity is also important because I believe that it is the key to the success of the new evangelization. Now, let me describe the situation in the United States, because unfortunately, at least in the church where I come from, in the church that I know the best, unity is much more an aspiration than a reality. Jokingly, I pointed out in, a, in one of the media interviews I did yesterday, that a recent poll in the United States found that 88%, that's 8-8, eight, 88% eight, 88 of American Catholics like the new Pope. They like Pope Francis. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is nothing short of a miracle, because in an average period, you could not get 88% of American Catholics to agree that today is Tuesday. Okay? So the fact that 88% of them like the Pope is astonishing. Okay. We often talk about the church in the United States as if it is polarized. And what people mean by that is that uh, Catholics are clustered either into the right or to the left. Okay. I think the truth of the situation is much more complicated. I would suggest that the sociologically accurate term for what we are in the United States as Catholics is tribalized. Because if you look around at the landscape, the Catholic landscape in America, what you see are competing tribes. We have pro-life Catholics, and we have peace and justice Catholics. We have liturgical traditionalist Catholics. We have church reform Catholics. We have Obama Catholics, and we have Romney Catholics. We have uh, the movements, and we have different ethnic Catholic churches, and so forth and so on. And again, I tell you, in principle, that diversity is a marvelous thing. It's one of the things that keeps the church in the United States alive. But the problem becomes when these different tribes start seeing one another as ideological, political, and theological enemies. And quite often, that is actually our situation. Now, two thoughts about that. One, this is not just a Catholic problem in the United States. It is a broad American problem. We are a badly tribalized society in every respect. If you want to read a great book about American sociology, I would recommend to you a book by a journalist by the name of Bill Bishop. And the name of the book is The Big Sort, S-O-R-T, as in sorting through things. Okay? Bill's argument, Bill was a journalist for the uh, Austin Statesman, a newspaper in the city of Austin in Texas. He covered the 2004 presidential campaign between George Bush and John Kerry. And of course, Texas, in America, we talk about red states and blue states, right? The blue states would be the states that vote for the Democrats. The red states would be the states that vote for the Republicans. Texas in 2004, ladies and gentlemen, was the reddest of the red states. Okay? It was written into the fabric of the universe since the Big Bang that in 2004, Texas was going to vote for George Bush. Okay? However, Bill asked himself this question. He said, if Texas is such a red state, why don't I see that? And why don't I feel it? And why don't I smell it? in this little liberal enclave he lived in in Austin, okay, which was composed and populated entirely by very liberal, secular, democratic voters. Okay. It is, by the way, an experience I can connect with. I, when I'm in the United States, I live in Denver, in the state of Colorado. Now, Colorado has both red and blue in it. That is, there are both conservatives and liberals. But you certainly wouldn't know that from the, literal, the little chic liberal neighborhood that we live in in Stapleton, Colorado. 
It's a place my wife chose. Okay. My wife, by the way, uh, is not Catholic. She is Jewish. And I like to say that she is the founder of a fourth version of American Judaism that I like to call Obama Messianism. Okay? My wife is not waiting for the Savior next year in Jerusalem. As far as she is concerned, he is already in the White House. Okay? Uh, and so when she relocated us to Stapleton, she chose this little, this, this liberal island, okay, where everyone drives a Prius, wears Birkenstocks, eats granola, and votes for Obama. There is a little vegetarian restaurant she drags me to every Saturday morning. And folks, I will tell you this. If secular liberalism had a chapel, this is where they would go to pray. Okay? The way I amuse myself is by sitting with her at the table and in a voice loud enough for everyone to hear, I like to say things like, Honey, you know who's really badly misunderstood? You know who's really a nice guy and doesn't get enough credit? Dick Cheney. There's a really great guy. Every time I do this, my wife looks at me with horror and says, Well, next week, why don't you bring your white sheet and burning cross? Right? This is the way I amuse myself on weekends in Denver. Well, in any event, Bill had the same experience when he was writing this book, and so he began to do research. And what he found is that the dominant trend in American life for the last 35 years is that increasingly, Americans are choosing to live, work, worship, and recreate only with people who think like themselves. We have, in effect, become a nation of gated communities gated communities both of the physical and the virtual sort. And the, the most important bit of data from Bill's book was this. He compared the 1968 election in America and the 2004. In 1968, the race was between Richard Nixon, the Republican, and Hubert Humphrey, the Democrat. In 2004, it was between George Bush and John Kerry. Very similar election in that they were very tight races, they were fought out on the terrain of values, and the Republican won a narrow victory. The difference is that in 1968, 75% of the people who voted for Hubert Humphrey said they had a close personal friend who had voted for Richard Nixon. In 2004, only 35% of the people who said they voted for John Kerry said they had a close personal friend who had voted for George Bush. Now, make sure you get the point. The point is not that we were more divided in 2004 than in 1968. No, we were as badly divided then as we were 35 years later. The point is that in the intervening period of time, we had become strangers to one another. And it is much easier, ladies and gentlemen, to demonize a stranger than it is a friend. So the payoff here is that if we are going to promote a stronger climate of unity in the church, we need to realize this is a profoundly countercultural exercise. Because everything in our culture tells us that we should treat people who do not think like us as enemies, not as friends we are going to have to swim against a very powerful cultural tide. Okay. Secondly, a uh, second observation about the situation in America is that those traditional pillars of Catholic life that are supposed to promote unity in the church have too often broken down and have instead become agents of tribalism. Okay. Let me tell you what I mean. Let's start with the parish. The parish is supposed to be the microcosm of the diversity of the church, right? It's supposed to be that place where Catholics of all different temperaments and all different outlooks and all different opinions come together around the common table of the Lord. Fortunately, there still are parishes that work like that. But I will tell you, in the main in the United States, this is no longer the case. 
Right now, today, you could get on a plane from Santiago and fly to any major city in America you want to. And if you find a Catholic who knows the way of the land, in five minutes, they could tell you where the traditionalist parishes are and where the progressive parishes are, where the pro-life parishes are, where the peace and justice parishes are. Okay. We have, in effect, developed in parishes in the United States a system of gated communities. People choose their parish on the basis of what they perceive to be its ideological and theological outlook. They, they go to parishes where they think they're going to find Catholics like themselves. So, unfortunately, our parishes, which are supposed to promote unity, uh, in, in many cases, unfortunately, instead now promote tribalism. And if there's one ironclad law of sociology that every empirical study confirms, okay, it is that moving in a homogenous environment that is moving in an environment where you meet only people who think like you promotes more radicalism. It radicalizes people. It pushes them towards extreme versions of their ideas. Whereas moving in a heterogeneous environment, that is where you're running into people who do not think like you, moderates people. It pushes them towards the center. So by building a parish system of gated communities, Without ever thinking about it, the church in the United States, in many ways, is promoting radicalism. More and more extreme position versions of the positions that people already hold. But that's our parity. Let's talk about the Catholic media in the United States. You would like to think that the Catholic media would be a kind of virtual space to build common ground. Okay, in which Catholics of different temperaments and outlooks can come together and share experiences and ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you once again, this is not really how the Catholic media in the United States functions. We have four nationally distributed Catholic newspapers in the United States. Every one of them has a crystal clear ideological alignment. Okay, everyone knows what side of the street these newspapers are talking to, and what side of the street they're talking against. Okay. This is also true of Catholic broadcast in the United States, in the TV and in the print world. And it is certainly true of Catholic blogs in the United States. Now look, you know, I'm 48 years old. I know that I'm something of a dinosaur. I don't want to be critical of blogs. I love them, let a thousand flowers bloom. But when you read a lot of Catholic blogs, particularly in the United States, what you get often is anger. And what you get is sort of tribal insight. In fact, um, I don't know if any of you in this room are fans of the American TV series The Simpsons. But I am a huge Simpsons fan. There is an episode in which Homer Simpson once uh, buys a snow plow. And he starts launching a, a snow plowing business where he'll go to your home and use his snow plow to remove the snow from your driveway. And to promote his business, he puts an ad on cable television at 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, Bart Simpson asks his dad, but dad, who is actually watching cable television at 3 o'clock in the morning? And Homer says, well, uh, alcoholics, the chronic unemployed, angry loners. Ladies and gentlemen, I often think these are the same people who write blogs. Okay. <laughs> so what you get often is a lot of heartburn. Uh, on the blog. Okay, my point uh, is that Catholic media, which you would like to believe, would be promoting a spirit of unity in the church, quite often instead fuel a climate of division. Okay. Now, let's talk about Catholic universities in the United States. Again, you would like to believe that this is a kind of common space in which the life of the mind comes alive and people with all kinds of different ideas come together to try to build a common Catholic witness. And again, that does happen some places at some times, and thank God for it. 
But I will tell you, my experience as a journalist is that our Catholic universities, and in particular the theology departments in our Catholic universities, are in fact the most tribalized, the most badly divided spheres of life on the American Catholic landscape. Okay. Again, what you get in the main uh, is not promotion of unity, but promotion of kind of tribal conflict. So my point is that these three traditional pillars of Catholic life, the parishes, the Catholic media, and the universities, which traditionally would foster a kind of common Catholic culture in America, all have broken down. And now what they foster is a kind of sense of tribal rivalry. Okay? So we need to realize that we are swimming against a powerful cultural tide and that many of the traditional resources we have in the church are no longer going to help us. The question, therefore, becomes, what do we do about that? What's the solution to all of that? And ladies and gentlemen, I don't have a magic bullet solution. I don't have the perfect answer. But I will give you, in my experience, the only thing that works the only thing that works to promote a greater spirit of unity in the church. And the only thing that works, in a word, is friendship. Friendship. I am profoundly convinced that what we need in the Catholic Church in the early 21st century is a grassroots effort to promote zones of friendship across these tribal lines. And I want to repeat that because every word in that formula is important. We need a grassroots effort to promote zones of friendship across these tribal lines. Let me say two things about that. First, how do I know that friendship works? Well, let me tell you a story. In 2002, okay, when I was in Rome writing a column called The Word from Rome, 2002, I did a very simple 800-word column about Opus Dei. Now, as you know, back then, this is pre-Da Vinci Code, so Opus Dei was still the world's leading magnet for conspiracy theory. Okay? And there was a certain kind of Catholic that thought of Opus Dei as the Darth Vader of the Catholic Church. Right? There was a kind of Catholic that if you said Opus Dei to them, they would hear the Imperial Death March from Star Wars in their heads. Right? Dun, 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 dun. Right? I wrote a very simple column saying, look, I know what a lot of people think about Opus Dei, but let me just describe the people from Opus Dei I have met in world who seem to me very decent, normal people. Okay, and so maybe we can get past some of this mythology. 800 words. I wrote it in about 20 minutes. I did not perceive it to be a turning point in my career. I have never gotten more mail, more phone calls, more readable response to anything I have ever written in my entire life. And the striking thing about it was that everyone was mad. Left, right, center, didn't match. Okay, everyone was angry. So I said to myself, I made this vow. I am never again in my life going to write about Opus Dei. Ever. Okay. Two years later, it's 2004, the Da Vinci Code book, not yet the movie, but the Da Vinci Code book has come out. And I'm having lunch with a friend of mine in Rome, a guy by the name of Mark Porojo, who at the time was sort of the spokesperson for Opus Dei in Rome. And Mark says to me, why don't you, why don't you think about writing something uh, about Opus Dei and the Da Vinci Code? And I, I explained to him, Mark, I'm not going to do that. And let me explain why I'm not going to do it. Uh, and he said, but, 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 but come on. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll give you whatever you want, you know, to make this interesting to you. And I said, ah, you know, I mean, I appreciate the offer, but I'm just really not interested. And I kind of forgot about the conversation. Later that day, I was back in my office. And my publisher at Random House in the United States, this big publishing house, calls me, uh, and he says, hey, John, what's your next book project? And I said, well, funny you should ask. As a joke, I said to him, 
I was having lunch today with a guy who said I ought to do something in Opus Dei. Now, my publisher is thinking of the Da Vinci Code. You can hear cha-ching, cha-ching going off in his head, right? He thinks this book is going to sell. He says, that's a great idea. You have to do it. You have to do it. So, I turned to my wife at dinner that night, and I said, honey, I've got some news. I'm not sure how you're going to react to it. Okay, but I want you to know there seems to be a lot of interest in me doing a book about Opus Dei. Now, my liberal Jewish feminist wife, okay, you can imagine what she thought about the idea of spending the next year and a half living with Opus Dei. Okay. Now, when I started this project, I said to myself, I don't just want to do this story from Rome. Okay, I want to go around the world and see Opus Dei in different places. So we went to Peru, we went to Kenya, we went to Russia, we went to the UK, uh, in addition, obviously, to the States, Spain. And my wife, Shannon, made most of these trips with me. Not because she had any interest in Opus Dei, but simply because she wanted to see the world. All right? Now, the way this would work is that when I landed in one of these places, I always said there are three groups I want to see. I want to talk to the Opus Dei people, I want to talk to the critics of Opus Dei, and I want to just talk to ordinary people to see what they think about it, right? But usually when I would land, the logistics, like getting us to our hotel and figuring out transportation and stuff, would be handled by the Opus Dei people because they're good at it. So, practically what this meant is that when we would land in a foreign country, I would go off and do journalism. And my wife would go off and play tour. And usually she was accompanied by some of the female numeraries from that country. Okay? Opus Dei numeraries. Who, without fail, were smart, funny, cool, hip, nice. She just fell in love with them every place we went. She still Facebook friends, okay, with these people. And it tore her up. I remember we went back to our hotel in Nairobi in Kenya one night after she did spent the day with these two 20-something Opus Dei numerators who she just adored, okay, and had a blast. Okay. And I could tell she was sitting on the bed, and I could tell she was in, in agony. She was struggling with her emotions. And I said to her, honey, what's wrong? She said, John, I know that politically I should hate these people, but they're just too damn nice. Okay. And now the comedy of it, of it is, whenever we are in a situation, my wife and I together, when Opus Dei comes up and somebody starts complaining about Opus Dei, I don't have to say a word. Because my wife is the one who will say, hey, you don't know these people. I do. Let me tell you what they're really like. Now, the moral of the story, ladies and gentlemen, was my wife converted to a more appreciative view of Opus Dei on the back of some rational argument? Did someone sit down and give her a series of syllogisms that led her to this conclusion? No. She was converted by the experience of becoming friends. And once she entered that space of friendship, she was able to take a more sympathetic and balanced view of the reality that she was looking at. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the magic bullet. It's friendship. It's a not argument. Okay. Now, let me give you another way that I know that friendship is the key. In the United States, the most prominent effort to promote greater unity in the church was launched by the late Cardinal Joseph Bernadine of Chicago. It was called the Common Ground Project. It was launched in the mid-90s. And Cardinal Bernadine's instinct was that he too saw that the church in the United States was becoming badly tribalized. And so he wanted to create this project to bring people together. So what they would do is they would try to bring the most conservative and the most liberal Catholic together, and they would put them in a room, close the door, and lock them, and hope that something magical would happen, okay, uh, that they would come out, you know, more united. 
The truth is, they usually spent the hour shouting at one another and left more excited than they had begun. Now, Common Ground was launched with the best intentions in the world. But I think the truth of it is, 20 years later, we're more divided than when it began. Question, why did it not work? Answer, it was a program in advance of a spirituality. You first have to have the spiritual experience of being converted to friendship before a program is going to do you any good. I mean, folks, it's a lot like recovery programs for drugs and alcohol, right? They do not work for people who do not want to help. Okay? And similarly, dialogue programs are not going to work for people who are not interested in talking to one another. So if we are going to truly promote greater unity in the church, if we are going to make this church attractive to the young generation, we cannot start with programs. We have to start with spirituality. And in particular, we have to start with the spirituality of friendship. So if you want a mission statement for church communications in the 21st century, my answer would be, let church communications be the place where these zones of friendship are built and where they're lived, okay, where they come alive. That is a precious contribution that communicators in the church could offer. And although I'm talking principally about the United States, frankly, I think we could use this pretty much everywhere. One final thought, and then I'm done. It seems to me that if we are truly going to pull this off, that is, if we are really going to foster a climate of greater unity in the church, we are going to need many qualities of heart and mind. Okay? We're going to need persistence. We're going to need audacity, as Archbishop Chaley told us yesterday. We're going to need deep prayer and deep faithfulness, many, many things. But I will tell you one thing that is absolutely essential to making this work, and that is a good sense of humor. Because if we cannot laugh at ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, we will spend all of our time in tears. And the good news is that you can find a sense of humor in the church, even in the most wildly unlikely places. And let me tell you one final story to illustrate that truth. 2005, you may remember, was a fairly busy year on the Vatican News feed. Okay? We had the death of John Paul and the election of Benedict XVI and all of that. Right? Now, immediately after Benedict was elected, I wrote a book about the new pope called The Rise of Benedict XVI. Okay? There is a tradition in the Vatican Press Corps that when one of us writes a book about the Holy Father, we inscribe a copy to him, and then we give it usually either to his secretary or to his spokesperson, right, to be presented to the Pope. Okay. Now, to be honest with you, it has never occurred to me for a moment that the Pope actually reads these books. Okay. In my mind's eye, I had envisioned a box in the basement of the Apostolic Palace, okay, where all of these books just gathered dust, okay? So Benedict is elected in April. My book comes out in May. I inscribed a copy. I gave it to Joaquin Navarro, who at the time was still the Pope's spokesperson. Then my wife and I came back to the United States for vacation, and I forgot all about it. So this is now August. Okay? My wife and I are out in rural western Kansas visiting my 98-year-old grandma who lives in a little western Kansas town called Hill City. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that is the worst place name in the world because there is no hill and there sure as hell is no city. Okay, we're talking about 700 people. But anyway, there we are in Hill City, America, in August, and one day my cell phone goes off, 
and it's Navarro calls. The Pope spoke, and you know how you can tell who's calling on your phone, right? So I can tell who Navarro calls. Call. And I get the phone, and I say, you know, what? Let me close the chance. Uh, and he says, well, John, I want to let you know that I am with the Holy Father on vacation in northern Italy. And he came down to breakfast this morning with your book in me. By the way, I cannot prove this to you scientifically, but I am completely convinced this was the first time in human history a phone call had ever been made from the papal apartment to Hill City, Kansas. Okay. So I said, so the Pope had my book. It's very interesting. Great. And he said, well, there's more. He said, the Holy Father asked me to deliver a personal message to you. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've just been told that the Pope has a personal reaction to something you've written about him, I would want to make sure that your tray table is in a full upright and locked position because the sky might get a little bumpy. But of course, Joaquin, that's fascinating. What's the message? Now, to understand this, you need to know that my book was divided in three parts. Okay? The first part were the final days of John Paul II. The middle part was the inside story of the Concord, of how Cardinal Ratzinger was elected as Benedict XVI. And that the third part were my predictions for where his papacy would go. Okay? So Nevada Vol says, the Holy Father message to John is the following. He said, please thank Herr Dr. Allen for having written this book, especially the last third about the future of my papacy, because it has saved me the trouble of thinking about it for myself. <laughs> I like to think he was kidding. Ladies and gentlemen, to me, this is the key. If we can take a clear-eyed look at the challenges we face, but if we can do that with humor in our hearts rather than anger, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the key. That is a winning strategy to Catholic communications in the 21st century, not just for the United States, but everywhere. And I hope you will join me on this great adventure of using our capacity as communicators to try to rebuild these zones of friendship that our church so desperately needs. Thank you, and from my heart, God bless all of you. Bien, eh, vamos a cambiar el sistema, dado que fracasó rotundamente ayer el sistema de escribir papeles. Eh, la idea era que fuera más rápido. Entonces, vamos a pasar micrófonos para aquellos que tengan preguntas. Les pedimos que sean muy breves. Ojalá que, eh, si quieren hacer una reflexión personal, ojalá que no sea muy larga. O ojalá que no sea, sino que sea directamente una pregunta. Eh, para así aprovechar el tiempo que es escaso. Levanten la mano y las señoritas van a, van a pasar. Aquí hay una primera pregunta del capellán general de Duo, que puede ser buena para empezar. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. La pregunta de usted hizo alusión a los Simpsons, muy a la pasada. Eh, a mí también me gustan mucho. Entonces quisiera ver la opinión que usted tiene porque en nuestro canal 13, canal de la Universidad Católica, al menos lo que le resta, lo exhibe todos los días. Entonces la visión religiosa que tiene los Simpson me parece interesante y poder compartirla que usted nos dé su opinión. Gracias. Well, first of all, let me compliment you on your taste in television. Okay. Uh, listen, uh, you know, there's a friend of mine by the name of Doug Orsuto who is a journalist who writes for a newspaper in Orlando, Florida, who has done a book about the theology of the Simpsons. So I would, I would actually recommend it to you. It's actually quite well done. Um, what I would say, I think in general what I would say, uh, is that, that the, the church, I think, is at its best when it views the culture, including pop culture, 
not with a hermeneutic of suspicion, but with a hermeneutic of generosity. Okay. John Maria Dion, who is the editor of Observatorio Romano and a good friend of mine, got in trouble a couple of years ago when Observatorio Romano carried a very positive article uh, about the census. Um, arguing that there's actually a great deal to be learned about contemporary religiosity, contemporary religious incidents uh, from watching the census. Uh, I, I would certainly recommend it. Um, I mean, personally, I believe that there is not a single situation you could ever encounter in life in which there is not an obvious Simpsons reference. Okay? I mean, to me, there are two things that speak to every one of life's situations. Actually, three. Three great forces in life from which there are lessons to be learned about everything that can possibly happen to you. One is the Summa Theologica of Thomas Aquinas. The second is the Simpsons. Uh, and the third is baseball. If you understand those three things, you are going to be equipped for any challenge life ever gives you. In the back. Eh, buenos días. Soy profesor de filosofía del derecho y quiero hacer una pregunta relacionada con la, la, el Papa y la verdad que enseña el Papa como fundamentos de la unidad católica. En, la pregunta tiene que ver con una cosa personal, una anécdota que voy a contar, que es que muchas veces yo intervengo en debates con colegas míos que son muy anticlericales y somos bastante amigos porque sabemos que pensamos muy distinto y no tenemos ninguna pretensión de una verdad común. Eh, en cambio, en los debates con católicos que a mí me parece que no siguen la doctrina del Papa, el asunto se pone más complicado. Es decir, es gente con la que uno piensa que debería encontrar un punto de unidad, que es el Papa, y realmente no lo encuentra. So, mi pregunta es, a nivel periodístico, ¿cómo se hace para tratar de conjugar, como dice el, el, el Papa Benedicto XVI, en Caritas in Veritate, el tener esta caridad o esta amistad, tanto con la gente que está fuera de, de la Iglesia como con los que están dentro, sin sacrificar el valor de la verdad, poniendo la poniéndola también como un elemento de unidad. No pensar que la, la verdad es algo que nos divide, sino también es algo que nos puede unir. Gracias. Thank you. Um, first of all, you're quite right. That dialogue with people outside the church, paradoxically in some ways, is much easier than dialogue with people inside the church. Because with people outside the church, we can often just agree to disagree. You know, that option isn't so much available to us with people who are at least supposedly part of the, the community of faith. You ask, how can the teaching of the Pope act as an agent of unity? First answer to your question is get people to actually read it. I mean, the difficulty often is that people are forming opinions about whatever the Pope has said or done, not based on the actual reality of it, but based on reports or opinion or commentary about it at second hand. Okay, so the first challenge, I think, is, get, is to get people to make contact directly with the reality itself. This is not easy. Okay. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that, that as, a, uh, as a Vaticanista who has covered Benedict XVI for the last eight years, okay, I think one of the great tragedies of this papacy is that I am profoundly convinced that 200 or 300 years from now, we will look back at Benedict XVI as one of the great teaching popes of the modern era. Okay, this pope's objective over the last eight years was to lead a kind of global graduate seminar on the relationship between reason and faith and the place of people of faith in a postmodern secular world. And I am totally convinced that down the line, it will be impossible to write a graduate thesis on that subject. It will be impossible for any serious intellectual to wrestle with these issues without taking account of Benedict's contributions to the subject. There is a four-volume masterpiece 
that Benedict delivered on this subject in the form of four cornerstone speeches during his papacy. The speech he gave in Regensburg in September 2006. Now, unfortunately, nobody got past the first line of reading that speech because the Regensburg speech, of course, opened with that now famous quotation from a 14th century Byzantine emperor by the name of Manuel II Paleologus to the effect that Muhammad brought things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. And that line, ripped out of context and then fired out of a media cannon, made the rounds of the world and it created a firestorm of protest in the Islamic street. And when I say firestorm, I am not talking metaphorically, okay? There were churches firebombed on the West Bank and Gaza Strip. There was an Italian nun stuck to death in Mogadishu and so on. But if you get past that opening sentence, what you will find in the Regensburg speech is 5,000 words about the relationship between reason and faith. So there's Regensburg, there's the speech he gave uh, at the Collège de Bernadine in Paris uh, in 2009. There's the speech he gave at Westminster Hall in the UK in 2010. Standing, by the way, on the very spot where St. Thomas More was condemned to death in 1534 for refusing to renounce his loyalty to the Bishop of Rome. Imagine the historical irony of the Pope standing in that spot and addressing the cream of the crop of British civil society. Okay. So that Westminster speech. And then finally, the speech he gave at the Bundestag in Berlin in 2011. Those four speeches ought to be published together with commentary from people such as yourself because they are brilliant reflections uh, on this theme. The tragedy of the papacy was it was very difficult to tell that story because we continually were distracted by other stories that we had to tell. So there was the, the Muslim protest for Regensburg, which meant that nobody ever wanted to got around to reading the rest of the speech. Okay? In 2007, we had the controversy over the dusting off the old Latin mass and the Good Friday prayer for the Jews. In 2009, we had the controversy over the Holocaust-denying bishop, Bishop Williamson. Okay? In 2010, we had the explosion of the sex abuse crisis uh, in Europe. In 2011 and 2012, we had Vatty leaks and, and, you know, the arrest of the Pope's butler and, you know, all of that stuff uh, to deal with. So from a media, and so, listen, let's, let's tell the truth to one another. Some of these crises came in on the church from the outside, but some of them were self-inflicted, okay? I mean, some of them, to be com completely honest with you about it, were about breakdowns in governance inside the Vatican itself. Okay. But, for whatever reason, my point is that the, what I consider to be the sinful story to tell about this papacy, this was a teaching papacy, and it was a magnificent teaching papacy, that story was very difficult to tell because of the distractions that constantly surrounded it. So, to come back to where we begin, you said, how could we use the teaching of the Pope to promote unity in the Church? I would say, first of all, by getting people to encounter it, and secondly, by understanding that getting them to encounter it is often going to mean finding creative ways to break through what can be a very strong media filter. And it is also, I think, about trying to reform some of the internal systems in the church so that we don't constantly keep offering the world distractions. I mean, listen, why is it that in the, in the run-up to the conclave that elected Pope Francis, why is it that you heard so much talk about reform of the Roman period? Okay? Is it because the cardinals wanted to elect a business manager? Is it because they thought they were hiring the CEO of Microsoft? No, they were interested in reform of the Roman Curia for precisely this reason, because they think that breakdowns in the Roman Curia are creating obstacles to evangelizing the world and to inducing people to make contact with the teaching, which is actually the heart uh, of what the, the modern papacy is trying to accomplish uh, on the global stage. Hi. 
Um, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Wherever, where are you? Hi. There you are. Oh, okay. What do you think about the term apostolic synergies? That is, uh, we don't, we not only be friendly to one another, uh, but also we should try to promote to, to do things together, to share knowledge, to share resources between the different charismas. charismas. I'm what, first of all, you ask, what do I think about apostolic synergy? One, I like that phrase, and I'm going to steal it. Okay. Uh, secondly, I like the idea behind it. Look, friendship is not a point of arrival. It is a point of departure. Okay. Friendship is the beginning of trying to create deeper unity in the church. I would say apostolic synergy, as you call it, would be the fruit of having done that. I mean, in other words, in my experience, when you bring together Catholics with different outlooks, with different priorities and different dreams and so forth, and you first create space in which they can organically become friends, then inevitably what results from them is what in English we would call hybrid vigor. You all know what that means. When you take one plant and you take another plant and you breed them together, the resulting plant is actually stronger because it includes the best genes from both. Okay, that's called hybrid vigor. And I think when you create zones of friendship in the church, that's what you get. You get a new plant that is actually stronger, more durable than either of the individual plants before would have been on their own. Okay? Let me give you two examples. There is a Catholic media outfit uh, in Canada called Salt and Light. Okay. It was founded by a bazillion priest by the name of Father Tom Rosicki. Uh, Tom was the CEO of World Youth Day uh, in Toronto in 2002. <laughs> by the way, cute little story about that. Uh, I was doing commentary for CNN uh, during World Youth Day in Toronto in 2002, uh, and my friend, George Weigel, who is a very well-known American Catholic writer, was doing commentary for NBC, okay? Now, at one stage, the weather the night before the big papal mass, the weather had been awful, okay? And the morning of the papal mass, the weather was really bad. That is, on, oddly enough, until John Paul showed up in the Pope mobile and then the clouds parted and the sun came out, make of that what you will, but in any event, this is about an hour and a half before, and it was raining, and the winds were just awful, okay? We were on this TV platform about 50 feet, you know, above the field where the mass was going to take place. The winds were shaking the thing so bad that at one stage, a guy in an orange vest with a megaphone came running up the stairs shouting, evacuate, evacuate, okay? You have to leave. Everybody left except for George Weigel and me, because we were both about to be on television, and we were damned if we were going to lose our 15 minutes of fame just because of some wind. Now, George, you have to understand, is seen as very, very conservative. And although most people would see me as balanced, they would see the newspaper I write for is quite liberal. Okay? So, we're in the eye of this hurricane, the only two guys left on this platform. And George turns to me and says, you know, if we die together here today, it will be the ultimate proof of the universality of the church. <laughs> anyway, Tom was the guy who had organized all of that. Uh, and Tom is, is an extraordinarily charismatic and, and dynamic priest. And he had brought together this team for World Youth Day of primarily young people who came from all different kinds of Catholic tribes, all those different tribes I discussed. And it was so successful that they wanted to keep it going. So they developed, out of World Youth Day, they developed a whole media empire in Canada. So it's a nationally distributed cable satellite television network. There's a radio network. Uh, they have a documentary production house. They have a very dynamic website. It, it's an extraordinarily effective operation. And the genius of Salt of Light it is, is that it is precisely an example of what I was describing as a zone of friendship. 
Because every kind of Catholic in Canada, from the far left to the far right, somehow feels themselves represented uh, in what salt and light does, and no one feels excluded from it. It really is nothing short of a minor miracle. And in addition, uh, it is also, Canada is a very secular media market, but salt and light is very popular even with non-believing crowds who will watch many of their documentaries about prayer. You know, what, what does it mean to pray? Uh, who are the saints, and what does it mean to live a life of holiness in this world? So, it's an example that if you build it, they will come. Okay. Another example I would give you uh, is uh, an outfit called Catholic Voices. Catholic Voices is a project that was born in the United Kingdom in 2000. I know there are some Catholic Voices people here. Catholic, Catholic, listen, I've endorsed Catholic Voices before. You don't have to tweet this out, okay? You know, my blurb is on their books and all of that. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, Catholic Voices, if you don't know, it was born in the UK in 2010. This, uh, it, it, of course, Benedict XVI was going to the United Kingdom in 2010. Everyone knew in advance that this was going to be a difficult trip. Okay? I mean, first of all, making fun of the Pope is sort of the national sport in the United Kingdom. Okay? This is a country that was born in opposition to Rome. Okay? Its whole national identity is invested with not being Catholic. Okay? Secondly, 2010, the sex abuse crisis was exploding across Europe. Okay, there were actually human rights groups that wanted to, to, to put handcuffs on the Pope when he stepped off the papal plane and charge him criminally for his alleged role uh, in the pedophilia crisis. Okay? And the drumbeat in the media was very difficult leading up to this trip. So, some Catholics in the UK decided we got to do something to make sure this does not become a complete disaster. Okay? And their idea was to bring together a group of young Catholics, again, from all different points of view, give them a crash course in kind of media literacy and also in the hot button issues facing the church so they could talk intelligently about them. And then turn them loose to give interviews to all the different print journalists and all the different broad, broadcast outlets so they can become the soundtrack of the papal visit. And it was a, a magnificent, magnificent success. And my proof is this, folks. The last thing that Benedict did before going back to Rome is he went to Birmingham in England to beatify Cardinal John Henry Newman. It was a Sunday. Now that day, I had to be doing the CNN commentary, and they didn't have a location in Birmingham, so I had to stay in London in the CNN studio and sit on a set, okay, and watch everything on a TV monitor. This, by the way, is television, folks. You're not actually covering the story. You're creating the impression that you're covering the story. And anyway, that's what I was doing. Uh, and, of course, we cut out after the Pope's homily. We didn't take the entire Mass. So basically, after the homily was over, I was done. Okay? Mass went on for another hour or so. So we decided, the producer and the cameraman and I, and a couple of other, other people in the CNN office in London, we went around the corner to a pub to get lunch, okay? So I'm sitting at a bar, drinking a pint of Guinness. There are two guys next to me who were the ultimate, like, cockney, completely secular, you know, kind of classic urban English thing, okay, who were at this bar. They were waiting for the Man City and Manchester United soft match to come on in an hour. But while they were sitting there, Sky News still had the papal mass on, okay? And they had a couple of these young Catholics from Catholic Voices talking about it. And they were just talking about, you know, what it means to them to be a believer in this world and what the church means to them. And they just seemed so normal and so human and so articulate and so rational. These guys were really charmed, Okay? And one of them turns to the other. I am not making this up. This is a direct quote. Okay, one of them turns to the other and says, Oi! 
maybe these bleeding Catholics aren't so bleeding crazy after all. Now, I thought that was a huge win for the home team. Okay? So that was the Catholic voice of instinct. Once again, it was so successful that it outlived the event for which it was created. Now it has become a kind of global trend, uh, and Catholic voices is spreading to different parts of the world. One of the very interesting things about it is, do you know who the two founders of Catholic Voices were originally? One guy who was the former managing editor of The Tablet, which is the left-wing Catholic paper of record in the United Kingdom, and the spokesperson in the United Kingdom for Opus 6. But these two guys, Austin Ivory and Jack Vallejo, are very good friends. And that spirit of bringing together the different Catholic instincts, the different Catholic tribes, is very much part of what Catholic Voices is about. My point, to go back to where we started, both these two things, Salt and Light and Catholic Voices, are examples of apostolic synergy. They're examples of the kind of new strength you gain when it's not just one tribe against another, but when it's all the tribes pulling together. One more? Okay. Here. Good morning. Morning. Uh, we are from Argentine, and we are used to the way that Cardenal Bergoglio talks, but I wonder if um, Pope Francis can reach a uh, the hurt of uh, the, the humanity that suffers most. Talking about tender tenderness and using the humor as well. I mean, do you think that uh, this is springtime uh, with the world uh, and the Pope can stay longer uh, talking about these uh, simple things of the human heart against the theological stuff, I mean. Uh, first of all, let me say that I spent the last week in Buenos Aires trying to get a sense of, of who Francis might be based on who Bergoglio was. Uh, and it was a magnificent, magnificent experience. Um, I, I spent, one of the things I did is I went out to, I don't know if you know the, the parish, the version of Takupe in, uh, in one of the beaches in Buenos Aires. Um, but if you want to understand the priestly soul of Cardinal Bergoglio, I think you have to spend some time in an environment like that because it really is his model of church. Uh, you asked, can Francis uh, reach the world uh, talking about simple things in the human heart? That might have been an interesting question three weeks ago. I think based on what we've seen over the last few weeks, the obvious, crystal clear answer to your question is, yes, of course he can, and that's precisely what he's been doing. I mean, come back to what I said, 88% of American Catholics like this guy? I mean, that is astonishing, and, and, and the reason that they have such a positive reaction to the man is not really based on anything he said. I think he has spoken much more clearly and much more loudly with his gestures than with his speech. Okay, these gestures of a humble, simple church, of a poor church for the poor, they clearly have been reaching the, the heart. I mean, my friends all across the United States tell me that attendance at Holy Week services was significantly up this year, and in particular, attendance at confession was significantly up this year. And if you ask people why they had come, many, many of them would say they had come because of the Pope. I mean, I think what we have seen from Francis is, in a way, a very clever, I mean, not that I'm, I don't think he thinks about it this way, but I, I think what we've seen is a very clever strategy for bypassing the filters uh, of, of the media and, and the, 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 the class of pundits and commentators, you know? When you see the Pope going to a youth prison in Rome on Holy Thursday and washing the feet of the young people, you don't need somebody like me to explain to you what that means. Okay? It is visually obvious. I, I don't know if you know the, the name of Father Osterhild, who was one of the spokespersons, or the spokesperson for the Bishops' Conference in Argentina, Father Jorge Osterhild. But one of the very interesting things he told me is that Bergoglio gave him a piece of advice a number of years ago. Osterheld had to write a statement okay, for the bishop's conference. 
and he asked Bergoglio, how do you want me to write this? And Bergoglio's answer was, write it so that even an illiterate person can understand what it means. Okay. Well, I think that the choices of his gestures are precisely that. I mean, they, they do not require the loss. They do not require explanation. Okay? They arrive directly, and, and they don't require a PhD in theology to understand. Now, I mean, having said that, uh, I will repeat what I said yesterday, uh, which is that I, I do hope that as Pope, Francis will be a little bit more willing to speak directly himself to the press than Cardinal Bergoglio was in Buenos Aires. Um, and that is A, because I am convinced he'll be terrific at it, uh, and B, uh, because I think there are times in the life of the church um, when the only way to bring a story, a negative story, to a halt uh, is, to, is to get a direct comment from the Pope about it. Well, let me tell you a quick example. In uh, another one of these meltdowns we were talking about earlier, uh, in 2009 in Italy, uh, there was a very um, surreal kind of soap opera that erupted called the Boffo case. Does this mean anything to anyone? Dino Boffo? Okay. Short version is this. Dino Boffo was a very well-known Italian Catholic journalist. He edited the newspaper of the Italian bishops called La Benita. Okay. Now, the first cycle of the story was uh, it emerged in an Italian paper that Boffo had been accused of harassing a woman in the Italian city of Terni by making harassing phone calls, supposedly because he wanted to have a gay affair with her fiancé. Okay? That was round one. Round two is it turned out that the police document charging him with that was a fake. Okay? Somebody had made it up. And then the question became, well, who made it up and why? Again, folks, this is Italy. Okay? God love them. The Italians have never seen a conspiracy theory they are not prepared to believe. Okay? So the leading conspiracy theory be became that this document had, been, had started with the head of the Vatican Security Forces, a guy by the name of Domenico Gianni, in cahoots, that is, in conjunction with John Maria Vian, the editor of L'Osservatore Romano, the Vatican newspaper, and ultimately, supposedly, they were acting on the authority of Cardinal Tarsicio Bucconi, the Secretary of State. Now think about that. That's, that's the number two guy in the Vatican power structure after the Pope. And to be honest with you, this was always incredible. Okay? It, it, it just defied belief. Because even if you want to believe that a cardinal of the church would be prepared to smear somebody's reputation like that, which I actually don't, but even if you want to believe that, the truth of it is, if Bertoni wanted to get rid of the editor of La Venere, he had much easier means at his disposal. All he had to do was pick up the phone. Okay? So, but, but people believed it because there was no response to it from the Vatican. For 18 days, this was the lead story in every Italian newspaper, and it was the lead item on the nightly news. 18 long days. And you all know how the media market works. People think that silence signifies consent. So the fact that the Vatican hadn't said anything about this was, was construed uh, as it being true. And then finally, finally, after 18 days, when the Vatican did issue a denial, I think Il Manifesto, which is kind of a left-wing anti-clerical paper, but it, but it did capture popular sentiment. It ran a banner headline, so big, by the way, that you would have thought that this was 9-11 all over again, okay, or that this was the bombing of Pearl Harbor, or that the world changed it, okay, this, this banner headline that read, Il Vatican nega tutto, nessuno ci prega. Okay. Which means the value, the Vatican denies everything. No one believes it. Okay. My point is that this is a classic example of where, if the Pope or someone else's authority, but certainly by far the most effective strategy is the Pope, uh, if the Pope had stepped into this story much earlier and said clearly, 
look, you know, I know what uh, Cardinal Bertoni would do and would not do. I know what uh, Il Pato Zidane and Il Pato Zidane are capable of. I can tell you for sure that we had nothing to do with this. Okay, That would have killed the story okay, much earlier in the news cycle than it actually kind of dropped away. Because the truth of it is, if you took a poll in Italy right now, I'm convinced that 80% of Italians would still believe Okay, that there was this grand conspiracy behind the Falco case. So, listen, I think Francis's greatest communication strategy is what we're already seeing. That is, these gestures that speak of a poor church for the poor. That said, I also hope he will have people around him, and I think he will because he has a good eye for talent. I hope he will have people around him who will give him good advice as to strategically smart moments to step into the news cycle and speak to the press in his own voice rather than letting other people speak to him. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much.